right, welcome back to the next episode of Structures. I think this is episode seven. Uh, a more organized man would have had that note prepared before me, but he's not in the building. So uh, today I have a, a really good uh, conversation coming up because I have no idea uh, what's going to come out of it, but I'm super excited because I met this cat and we don't even know each other. We just it was just a vibe and we're like hey let's do an episode right on we're both excited for it so uh looking forward to learning more about the man behind killer b relay team uh who is mike welcome mike to the show hey good to be here and uh right off the bat uh if you want people to find you tell them where to do so please oh yeah i am all over the internet uh you can find me at thekillerbrelayteam.com or just thekbrt.com, uh, which is a little bit simpler. Uh, I'm also the founder of Hive Mind Synthesis, so you can find me there. Uh, most of the time, though, you'll find me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash thekillerbrelayteam. And what, I'm vague on this. What is Hive Mind Synthesis? So Hive Mind Synthesis is my albeit small at this point, synthesizer company. Okay, I've been that's, involved. I, yeah. I didn't want to stick my foot in my mouth, but I had a feeling that <laughs> that's where I heard the name. And I did not even know this till right now. So this is pretty cool. Oh, yeah. So it's a small, at this point, synthesizer company. I have been kind of involved with DIY electronics since I started breaking things as a kid. And that has slowly built itself into an actual company that makes things which is pretty excellent oh that's very cool uh now i'm really interested let's uh i'm just gonna just jump right into to your story and you did send me some photos that we do for like the slideshow so i have those mm -hmm. pulled up if at any point you want to reference like certain ones or whatever you, you go right ahead and i'll jump to that folder or whatever or if or if you don't care i'll just let them uh, play or whatever so but other than referencing photos let's go back to where your interest in sound began and even well even before that you know how did you grow up uh what part of the world are you even in and uh yeah you know yeah sure so i am from east coast u.s i actually grew up in delaware of all places uh and have always been really interested in music some of my best early childhood memories are of listening to like yes and zappa records with my parents uh, and i'm still super into that kind of stuff and it's just always been a part of my life uh, music was just always on and i got to a point where i decided i wanted to start playing it and i picked up the drums around fourth grade and that's where my music playing really started but also that whole time i've really been interested in technology and figuring out how every little thing works, which resulted in a lot of breaking things <laughs> as a kid, uh, which resulted in me learning how to fix things, which is why I'm able to you know, modify and build some of my own synthesizer stuff these days. So it sort of came out of that childhood quest for figuring things out, then started playing in bands in high school and have just stuck with it in one way or another ever since that's that's really cool and i totally 100 percent relate to the um the trait of uh, just wanting to know how things work and figure out how things work uh i haven't dabbled much in electronics but i uh, a little more mechanical in the things i've done but uh i'm very yeah i like to see how things work i, I like to know how they work and kind of dissect them and i have plenty of broken things i took apart when i was a kid too in that on that journey. oh yeah um, yeah <clears throat> my mom loves to tell a story about me breaking the family vcr uh just because i wanted to figure out how it works and somehow i was left alone in a room with it and a screwdriver and next thing you know there are parts everywhere but i put it back together and it very rarely ate tapes after that point on a related note listeners tune in next week for his mom's side of the story Back to you, Mike. <laughs> It'll be pretty much the same story, except <laughs> I understand what I do a little bit more. <laughs> oh, that's cool. 
So when so you start out with drums, and where'd you evolve from there? Yeah, or, so I've started playing drums, but you know, and still play drums. Uh, and I've played in all sorts of different bands, pretty much any genre you can imagine. But there was always an interest in electronic music. Uh, really, even from a young age, just what's that weird noise, mm -hmm. listening to uh, something like a progressive rock record and hearing a synthesizer solo and being like, hot tooth, what the heck is yeah. that? Uh, and then being maybe one of the only drummers in the world that loves drum machines, mm -hmm. I found an old Roland TR-505 when I was out running around a yard sales with a friend and picked it up for five bucks, took it home and just started playing around and just got hooked to making electronic music. Uh, started doing some stuff on a computer using some of the old like multi-tracker software that was around in the mid nineties and rebirth and reason and kind of went down that computer route. And it just got so boring for me. I ended up just diving down into menus and spending an hour browsing for a kick drum sample. And it just yeah. didn't feel fun. It didn't feel creative anymore. Yeah. So now I use a computer to record what I'm doing and to mix it. And that's it. Yeah. 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 I, I relate to that. I, well, I didn't grow up with a computer, so it's not as natural to me. So, um, yeah, I also did not. Yeah. Uh, I grew up kind of getting some of my friends old computers like if I have a friend who got a new computer they'll give me their 10 year old computer that can barely do anything right uh, but then again it aided that sort of sense of exploration sure. and experimentation of like how does this work or how can I get it to work yeah definitely yeah I find I like that uh it, it may be just because I wasn't experienced with them but I just get more distracted and confused if I try to incorporate a computer to anything I do other than yeah. mov moving or storing files, it's, it's about it. Yeah. It's so full of distractions. Like I always tell people my modular synth doesn't give me a pop-up when I get an email. Like yeah. there, there aren't memes on it. <laughs> it's I like just, that. I can focus yeah. and work. I'm sure you could find meme stickers though, to put on it if you really wanted to. Oh, and I have them. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> at least they're static. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So what? So how long have you been uh, dabbling in the circus now? Or, or am I skipping over too much? I'm sorry. This is your story. Oh, no. You're not skipping over much at all. It's really been kind of just a constant ramping up of all these things that I've been into. Yeah. And then over the last, I'd say, about two years now, uh, I had a day job that went away and got to use this as a, an opportunity to try to do creative things full time, which has really allowed me to focus on music and focus on making music, making machines. Dude, that just makes me happy to hear uh, that uh, you see that perspective and maybe it's just enforced by it with hindsight now after some uh, success at, at making it happen. but. Just to see uh, losing one thing to gain another is uh, is not a loss at all, you know. Especially when it's something that's more fulfilling uh, for your life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everything is just a, a series of things. So, me losing a day job was just really an opportunity to move on to something else. Luckily, I have a supportive partners who can help me make our ends meet. You know, yeah. make sure that the important bills are all paid while I'm kind of out here living my best life right now. Yeah, just do, doing the best you can. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's been great. I've met a lot of really interesting people, and I've done a lot of really cool collaborations, both on physical like pieces of gear and musical stuff. And there's just a really great synthesizer and music performance community on the internet, and oddly on Twitch specifically. That really surprised me. Yeah, I haven't even uh, tried Twitch. Uh... And it's I daunting. Mean, I, I can I tell you. Say I haven't tried that. I have tried that, uh, but I didn't um, get fully submersed in it. But because mostly because I didn't have the capability to stream, uh, you know, well. So yeah, yeah. It it's definitely a process. That's been the hardest part for me. I've been streaming for about three, maybe four years now, and when I started off, I kind of 
I had a friend who told me, oh, I'm doing a, a festival on Twitch. I'm doing a fundraising event. Do you want to be involved in that? And I was like, oh, it sounds really cool, but like, I'm not really like a finger quotes gamer. Like, I don't play Call of Duty. Like, that's not really my vibe. And he's like, oh, no, there's music on Twitch, especially electronic music. And it's kind of blown me away. There's a, a wonderful synthesizer and electronic music performance community uh, that I've heard come up in at least one other episode of this podcast called the Golden Shrimp Guild, yes. which is just absolutely amazing uh, that an organization like this continues to exist, something that's free and positive, and there just aren't any jerks. Like, there's not drama, there's not infighting, there's nobody chasing clout. It's just a bunch of people focused on honing their craft and supporting each other. Yeah, that's that's so a if, beautiful thing. I love that. Yeah, and, you know, getting back to Twitch being kind of daunting, there's a lot going on. There are so many moving pieces, especially when you look at an established channel that's got stuff flying all over the screen and people in chat are redeeming things and it can just be a little overwhelming. But I recommend to anybody who's interested in live music just poke around on twitch for a little while see see what you can find it, it's sometimes the music's the vibe but sometimes the person is the vibe instead but there are a lot of really cool people doing some cool and inventive stuff right now yeah i i agree i've i haven't spent a lot of time on it but i've seen uh, some really interesting artists and like you said sometimes it's the sound sometimes it's the visual or the person it's uh that's the cool thing about when you take time to get to know someone you know, seeing those different nuances in the uh, in the basically relationships that you form, you know, it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and it's kind of a there are a lot of self fulfilling prophecies on Twitch. It's a community that supports itself, and that definitely funnels a lot of money into Amazon's pockets. We don't necessarily need to talk about that, <laughs> but it creates kind of you know there are a lot of parasocial relationships that we have nowadays where there are people that you know from social media that because everyone's so public and so connected you feel like you know them but you don't they have no clue who you are they right. they wouldn't know but you know every single intimate detail of their lives and with a live streaming service like twitch you kind of get that parasocial relationship in both directions yeah. like there are plenty of people who i watch stream who also watch me stream We've never met in person, though. I've met a lot of synth streamers, uh, yeah. thanks to a synthesizer convention that happens in the Midwest every year. And but, which one is that? I don't know. It's called KnobCon. Oh, yeah, I've heard of that, but I forget where it's at. I've never been, obviously. It's uh, just outside of Chicago, okay. and I've been there the last two years, and it is a, it's basically synth nerd sleepaway to camp. It's fantastic, just a bunch of people who are into electronic music and specifically the gear behind it. Just, you know, there's a standard convention floor where everybody's hawking their products where you'll definitely find me in Hive Mind Synthesis this year. But there's also just a great culture of uh, hotel room jams and lobby jams and just people really excited to show oh, I bet. what they've put together and to meet other people who are into the same thing. Because electronic music can kind of be insular. You spend a lot of time alone yeah. with your machines. And I think that the live streaming thing and then something like KnobCon really helps to make you feel a little bit more social about it, at least. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I've never been to an event like that, but uh, now I kind of want to go and meet you and other people there. And, uh, uh, I Two years ago was my first year. I had a bunch <laughs> of friends who went the year before that, and I just had such... FOMO and I'm like how could I have not gone to this and then I went two years ago and I'm like this I have to do this every single year yeah. like I just I have to it's my one thing that I have to do every year but it's just such a great experience and the organizers are really cool the live events you know last year there was a jam room where you could just come in and pick up an instrument and play and there are shows every night you know I stay up way past my bedtime it's it's great <laughs> yeah that for me that'd be like nine or ten yeah, same. I mean, I'm I'm an early riser. Uh, you know, I was up at six today, and when I'm at KnobCon, I'm going from like seven in the morning till four in the morning every day. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's partying out right there. <laughs> this sounds like yeah, fun. Right. Oh uh, yeah, just come out. 
Yeah. Oh, I, well, what time of the year is it? It's in September. It's, September. They have not announced okay. this year yet, but it's probably the second weekend of September. I want to. I don't know if I'll be this year or not. I'll have to see what it looks like because it's not unattainable, but it's a, that's a bit of a road sure. trip for me. I'm in Kentucky myself, so it's not, oh, okay. yeah, it's not yeah. too far, honestly, but it's uh, uh, a little bit yeah. of a stretch. Something to plan for. I you flew out the... Yeah, I flew out the last couple of years, and this year I'm driving out, and it's like 16 hours from the East Coast. But oh, I don't doubt it. I've, I've got too I've got too much gear to bring with me to have to ship it all out again. Yeah, I yeah, I think um, about half that distance probably. Um, if anyone knows the the region, I'm uh, near Louisville, <clears throat> which is uh, okay. Yeah, on kind of a north uh, central part of the state. Yeah, and I'm over uh, just outside Philadelphia. Okay, yeah, that's I've I've met a lot of um, uh, synth uh, players, enthusiasts, whatever you call it, synth people in that uh, New England area. It yeah, sounds like a we're we're out here. Area. Yeah, you're out there. <laughs> and in my area, I'm just like I can stand outside and say I'm out here and just hear it echo. And I don't know if anyone else is there. Um, that's why I like meeting people online. Yeah, yeah. I uh, at the same time, that sounds kind of nice to just be out there in the middle of nowhere every once in a while. Yeah. No, I just I just don't know anyone in the, in the area um, yet. I haven't been here that long, or even been into synthesizers that long myself. It's just kind of a new thing. But uh, you're talking about the community aspect is that's why uh, I was doing this this show in the first place was to just. Uh, you know, highlight that and encourage people because that's that's what I received a lot of friendliness and encouragement uh, when I met people. You know, yeah, absolutely. Through Instagram, and, you know, really. Which is something that most people don't say. Like, oh yeah, I have a, I'm having a really positive in, uh, experience on social media right now. That's that's not something yeah. you usually say. But there's something about this synthesizer culture and this group and the people that are involved with it who are just. I think it all has to not, do they're with... They're not playing games. Right, right, right. It it has a lot to do with how you use the the tools at your disposal, I believe. Like, uh, if you want to just blindly follow the lead social platforms layout for you, then it could be a draining experience. But, um, you know, I I get on there and I just check up to see see what so-and-so is doing or or send a message to another friend that was on my mind or something like that, you know, like a, yeah, yeah. It, more like a phone with visuals than a, something to surf on, you know? Yeah. Back the way it used to be. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So let, I, I'm, I'm getting on a rabbit trail with that. Let me get back to, to you and your story building uh cause I know you got so much to share. You got, so you, when did you start building your own modules or is that where you started? With mod- your rec modules? Well, I, it really started with getting friends broken gear and fixing it, either to use it myself or finding broken things at yard sales and <clears throat> flipping them to kind of get money to build up my gear stash. Because when people look at my gear collection, they think I'm a millionaire. And I very much am not. You're not? <laughs> I just, no, no, far, oh, from, I it, got far the, from it. I got the wrong mic on the line. Hang on. Oh man. Okay. No, I'm just later. kidding. No. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it just comes from, you know, savvy playing of the market, finding really good deals. Yeah. Finding broken things, fixing them, flipping them, that sort of thing. Like my whole collection is just made from buying cheap and selling high. Yeah. So that's kind of where the DIY and the synth company aspects came in is it really started with that same drum machine that I got at a yard sale, that Roland TR 505. Mm -hmm. Uh, I used to call myself the bend monger and did a lot of circuit bending, which I I don't know if you're familiar with circuit bending. Oh yeah. I've dabbled in it. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Nice. My favorite experience was getting a fuzz pedal to smoke. Oh, you released the magic smoke. Yeah, I did. Yeah. The essence of its life, uh, it's, it's force dissipated from the pedal into the ether yeah right, yeah if only you could get some more of that replacement smoke yeah put it right back in there get it running yeah. again 
or capture that sound I def- or something. I don't know. <laughs> right. There are some people out there that make some crazy stuff. There's a company that makes a synthesizer module that when you turn it on, it just fries your whole system. I'm sure it sounds interesting. Are you serious? That's a, that's a thing they do on purpose? Yeah, it was... Uh, it, I forget exactly what it's called. I'm going to have to look it up. Uh, but it was like a, a kind of a statement on capitalism sort of thing where it's just like destroy it all with the flip of a button. And they only made five of them. They also make a module that makes you blind if you stare into it. It's like an insanely bright light that turns on. Like I've seen some guitar pedals that I thought were like that. Yeah, <laughs> I bet. Uh, that's something I never really got into was guitar, and I wish I did. Uh, it would be great to be able to pick up an instrument like that and play a tonal thing. But anyway, I digress now. Back into the uh, electronics part of it. So it started with that TR-505 drum machine, uh, the one that I got at the yard sale. Right. The guy said it was broken. It wasn't. It just needed to have a couple of settings changed. Uh, but I found out that you can circuit bend it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we were on I've this. Been, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I've been circuit bending TR-505s for now. <sighs> 20 years I've been modifying them and getting them out into the world and I don't know I've probably done 25 or 30 at this point that people are using to make music somewhere yeah. uh, most recently I have uh, one that I released last year that adds all sorts of extra functionality like modular synthesizer trigger outputs and you can glitch it and you can run pattern glitches and tonal changes and all kinds of weird stuff but from that sort of experimentation doing that working on speaking spells other toys i kind of got a a little bit of a working knowledge of how some electronics function yeah and then from there i started to get into the modular diy scene built a whole bunch of module kits uh, decided that somebody needed to make a kit to create your own prototypes on a modular synth So I worked with uh, some friends at the time, Sentient Synths, to release something called the Pixie Dance Floor, which is a module that has a DIY breadboard on it. You plug it into your modular synthesizer. Okay, that's exactly... just kind of build... I didn't mean to cut you off. That's what I was picturing in my mind. As soon as you said a a, 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 a prototype board, I was picturing a Eurorack-mounted breadboard. Yeah, exactly. And it's got power inputs. And I think if you go into the HMS folder... Yeah, there's some pictures of it in there if you want to take a look in the images that I sent. Okay. But it's a great tool for developing your own Euro rack circuits. It's got switches. It's got potentiometers, jacks. Uh, we're working on an updated version of it now, as well as a whole host of other mostly passive mechanical modules, but really focusing on the theory and the learning aspect of things because I've built a lot of stuff and I have no idea how half of it actually functions. And I want people that build the hive mind stuff to actually know why they're putting those parts there and what each thing does. Well, that's either uh, some real authentic conversation we're having or a real elaborate uh, uh, sales pitch because we talked about that earlier, uh, learning how to, uh, you, you open with that, in your story, learning how to how things work, taking it apart. Oh, you know, and now you're making a product <laughs> to to fill that uh, kind of uh, desire, a curiosity for someone else. Well, that's everything really uh, that I do with Hive Mind Synthesis. Any products that I have, yeah. it's something that I made for myself. Yeah, that I showed to other people, and they said, "Oh, well, I want one of those too," and that just kind of spitballed into me, you know running a synthesizer company. I have my own line of cables that I developed in conjunction with the Golden Shrimp Guild because we thought, what am I looking for in a modular synthesizer patch cable? What's important to us? Yeah. Well, it'd be cool if they were in interesting colors so that you could trace them easily around your synthesizer. And they were small so that they were easy to work around and you know durable and inexpensive. And that's why we have the the cables that we have now, the stingers, because, because we wanted to take all the those perfect boxes. Perfect cable, yeah. Right, I'm like, this is my perfect cable. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there's our, I make this fun little box that I call Honey, that is a synthesizer interface. You just plug a cable into the end of it, and it outputs voltage that's based where, on how much light it's getting. That's where I 
seen the name. I've seen that. Yeah. Ah. And I can't remember where now. And I didn't, and this is not a joke for people listening. I, I didn't realize that this was my good five mind until he told me so on this recording. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that could come, that could be my fault because I no, love no doing fault these or, things. Or responsibility. And, well, or I just, I'm terrible at We self-promotion. just met and we, you know, <laughs> right. it wasn't like that, like a, a business thing. We just, Met, no, not I don't at all. even know how it happened. Oh, I had a, I got that other page. Um, uh, do, dollars not flawless or fa, fa, yeah, what yeah. What's it called? Anyway, I tried yeah, to do Dallas, a little flawless. repost page. I still look at it sometimes and do it, but not very often. But uh, yeah, I reposted one of your uh, jams on there, and and we just talked. And within a matter of a few messages, probably we we're booking a interview. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then I had to, uh, it's funny because I had to uh, reschedule it twice, two weeks in a row due to uh, some family thing coming up each week, which, you know, is fu- it is what it is. It's fine. But it was, I felt bad because I hadn't had to reschedule any yet. So I hate to tell this guy. And then I had to tell him again, <laughs> you know. But, but Mike, you're totally understanding of it and know that, oh, yeah. you know, life is, you got to handle life. Right, it's a good show. I can say, well, luckily, I'm a great guy, and I didn't make a big deal out of it. Yeah, yeah, no, luckily, no, you can. No, I like that humor. Yeah. <laughs> but so, yeah, that honey box was something where I'm like, huh, I wonder if I can just make a little light controller for my synthesizer. And I made one, and I'm like, oh, this is cool. If I make two, I can use them this way. And now I've got, I don't know, probably 25 left up on my shelf, waiting to go out. Uh, just again, a cool little thing that I made for myself, and other people said they want one too. Yeah, uh, which I think is is good. If you're a creative person and you make something, you should be making it for yourself first and foremost, and not for other people. Yeah. But if other people see it and they say, "I like that," "I want that," then great, excellent news. Yeah, no kidding. And is that any relation to uh, the name Hive Mind? Where did you come up with Hive Mind? Well, it's, you know, my music, I go by the Killer Bee Relay team and have for a while. So it kind of comes from the Hive Bee thing. But also, uh, Hive Mind Synthesis is not just me. I am definitely the face and I handle all of the behind the scenes stuff. But it really comes from me and my friends and the ideas that we can have as a group and that we bounce off of each other. So it is really kind of a, a Hive Mind that comes up with a lot of these concepts, at least by the time they make it out into the world. Uh, the modules that we have in development now, I have a friend who goes by DJ Doey, who helps a ton with development uh, and design. So it's really a group effort that's meant to serve the group. So that's where the hive mind thing comes from. Plus, just pollinators are cool as hell. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I love that, man. It's so no, cool and, because it's like you're, oh, you're recognizing the idea of the in your case it's specifically a, a product but the idea behind it that whole concept collectively was, was added to you know you all put your own energy and and input into it and t- collectively the hive mind result is you know is the product that's pretty cool yeah and it's it also thank you it's also about uh you know i spent a big part of my childhood living in a little rented house on a wildlife preserve and have gotten super close to nature because of that and i think there's a big disconnect between the world of natural things and the world of electronic music specifically Uh, yeah you know folk music acoustic music that can kind of have that natural element to it but electronic music tends to be sterile so that's why I like to make things like the honey, where you can use something natural like light to control the sound. I have a wind controller that I'm working on right now that just because I'm such a perfectionist, I haven't officially released, but it uses the speed of the wind to generate voltage for your synthesizer. Uh, I just love that idea. There's a guy named Jonah who created a module called the Pet Rock, not involved with hive mind synthesis at all, but just another really cool natural concept. It uses the moon phase and the day of the week to generate rhythms. Oh, wow. Like, uh, and I just love that that idea of trying to bring something... It, it, when you look at it from a synthesis standpoint, chaotic 
random, yeah. but when but you look natural. at it from a natural standpoint, yeah, it's it's sunlight, it's wind, it's something that's there regardless. And combining the two can be really cool. I'm actually working on something now that might be live by the time this podcast goes out, which is an always on 24 seven streaming outdoor synthesizer that uses all of these things that I've been talking about. You are Solar fucking kidding and, me. Uh, it uses wind speed. It uses water when it's raining, all of that kind of stuff. Plus I'm working on interactivity with chat as well to kind of just create music from the ether. I've done a few different projects that I call plant-based synthesis uh, that do that same sort of thing where I hook up biometric modules to plants and create a synth patch based on that output. Uh, in if you're going through the photos in the KBRT folder, there's some stuff about a, an album and a 12 hour film that I put out called Blackberry Jam. Okay. That is a synth patch hooked up to a blackberry bush. And I just ran video and audio for 12 hours see what kind of sounds it would make see uh, and i just i i yeah. i love that sort of natural chaos oh yeah this is this is stuff i love man and i didn't even know the depth of uh i don't know if that's the right word but the type of stuff you're into in in this realm with the uh, involve incorporating nature into or basically tr letting it translate into sound uh that's very cool and it's stuff i like to do as well so We'll have to, oh, we'll have yeah, to stay I, in touch. Maybe we can even uh, share some ideas or, or do something together. Sometime. Oh, yeah. Be absolutely. So cool. Yeah. Because I think that there is, it's a really kind of an untapped concept. Yeah. Uh, that I keep seeing more and more people tapping into. There's a module that just dropped a couple of weeks ago that uses planetary positions and a GPS to generate voltage. Like all kinds of really cool, interesting ways of introducing some sort of outside hand to what is normally like a very precise and programmed process. Right. And it will, it, to me, it kind of, it represents uh, an openness to go with the universe instead of trying to control each minute detail. You know, you can still yeah. greatly control some parameters of the whole situation, but to allow the natural world into that process uh it's, i just don't see where you can go wrong you know yeah it's really you just and it's you know how we all live our lives if you really think about it we just kind of exist within all of these other processes that are going around us so why not why not apply that to music as well and that's that's also kind of my creative process in general is that when i start recording when i even if we use a stream as an example, when I start any of my streams, I start with a kick drum. That's it. I have no plan. I have no presets dialed in. I have no idea what I'm going to do. It just depends on what happens, yeah. what gets pulled out of the ether, ether, what chat says to me, what, what I feel like, what I happen to click on accidentally when I'm, you know, moving through presets on the synthesizer, whatever it might be. Uh, which I think is a really natural way not to not to talk smack about anybody who actually has a lot of intent in their creative process. I kind of envy yeah. being able to go into it with that much intent. But I don't know. I just kind of float around on the waves of whatever's going on around me. This must be why we hit it off so well, so well right away because it's uh, that's how I love to jam too. Like uh, not specifically starting it with a kick drum, but just a super simple thing I don't overthink it I'm just making some sound and then I just what's what I call follow the sound and I just uh, you know try to catch that creative wave of, of sound energy that, that wants to come through and sometimes it's more like you're uh, just uncovering something that's already there you know instead of having to create it you know just yeah yeah exactly yeah, exactly. And I do a bit of that with, uh, I'm, I'm half of a band called Thick Wiccans. Uh, it's me and uh, another friend of mine who I've played <laughs> in a number of other bands I with. I saw that photo who... of the pictures and I wondered what Thick Wiccans was. I, I, I figured you would reveal the meaning. Yeah, uh, so we 
we've put out a couple of EPs so far. We're always working on stuff in the background, but that's even this. That is its root. We jam remotely. Uh, the other half of the band's in Massachusetts. I'm all the way down in in the Philly area, and we link everything up online. We jam for a few hours, and then we take those pieces and we chop them up and we turn them into releasable songs. So. I assume the picture of the two gentlemen with the beards is that you guys? Is the That's the two of us. Okay, and not and I don't know. So which one is you that I'm talking to, right or left? Uh, if you're looking at the two of us sitting, looking at you, I am the one on the right with the blue sunglasses. Okay, and more like a, a lighter colored shirt, some yes. unbuttoned. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, sweet. That and when you say you jam remotely. Uh, I always joke because when people say that, I, I like to say I do too, I jam remotely, uh, but it's like in the forest, you know? <laughs> oh, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, no, we use uh, software called NinJam, which uh, also runs with something called Jamtaba, which I think I've heard mentioned on the podcast as well. Yep. Uh, it's incredibly difficult to set up, but it does some really cool things particularly for electronic musicians where, you know, if, if you're doing anything online, particularly when it involves sound, you, you get lag. Yeah. It just happens. Yeah. So it makes playing music together online almost impossible. But what this software does is it introduces extra lag to the point where what you're hearing is actually what you're other player let's say played four or eight clicks ago got you and it does so, that in like in time i don't know how to say it but in, in a in a well, manner that's yeah it all or synced or whatever remains synced gotcha. and in time yeah you're just kind of off from each other by a measure or two uh, but that doesn't even matter which right exactly and with transitions and stuff, it can be a little funky, right? Uh, but or it can introduce some really cool stuff. But otherwise, the you know the root, the click is there. You're both hearing each other in time, yeah, in theory, but you're actually you know four or eight beats apart from each other. But it it works somehow, and is a ton of fun. It's um, it's almost makes me think of like some kind of a. Uh, parallel dimension uh, that's also playing along with you but you're both uh, only listening to the delay after the effects unit you know like pl- play, yeah sure based off uh, the delay but with someone else who's also doing that right yeah we're both playing off of the delayed version of yeah. the other person so but somehow it's cohesive so i bet you there's a lot of little happy accidents little bob ross moments little happy sounds oh, yeah. coming up and like, oh, this guy's going to live right here today, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or you're like, oh, wow, they went into that transition. Well, now I'll go into a transition. But then because of the separation, it's two transitions. And then and it does, just yeah, still, still lines up. Have you ever done that and then respond to each other again and, and, and create like a almost a call and response kind of effect? Oh, yeah. I mean, this, uh, my other half of Feck Wickens, he and I have been playing together for 15 years. Oh, gosh. So all you different, know how to do all different ways. together now. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we know the language. We know the signs that we use to indicate to each other for changes and stuff, even without seeing each other in the same room. Right, so right. It's, uh, it could be a lot of fun. Maybe even based upon just some of the nuances of your playing style, but playing that long together. You're like, okay, he's about to do this. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, like, oh, I recognize he's throwing in that extra snare drum hit. Yeah. That means, you know, we're four measures away from whatever it's going to be. Now, have you guys ever um, it discussed beforehand, like, hey, if you do hear uh, a, a triplet, then I'm about to do this? You know, have you ever planned something like that? Not not really. We we might do that when we go back to edit things later, because part of the process is yeah. taking those raw jams and then re-listening to them, adding parts, sending those parts back and forth. So we might do that at that point, but normally it's just, okay, you know, what key do you want to play in today? Yeah. All right, let's play in that key, and then just whatever happens to happen, happens. So Thick Wickens, correct me if I'm 
out of line here, but you guys you pretty much jam just like we were talking about earlier, just following the sound, just recording live jams and maybe editing out exactly, the, yeah. some after the fact. Yeah. Well, we'll follow the sound, we'll jam for two hours, we'll, and then we'll gradually try to cut that down to a listenable length, uh, which can be tough, yeah. you know, especially both of us being fans of, you know, the progressive rock and stuff that we grew up on. I'm like, there's no reason this song can't be the entire side of a record. Well, Nobody said we couldn't do that. <laughs> well, plus, what if there's other people that are into it, and even if it's not so popular, you could still have it available online to... Um, like an uncut version of the two-hour jam, <clears throat> the two-hour jam. Yeah, you know? and that that kind of brings us back to talking about the community aspect of all of this and the online synthesizer community. Is you know, for years and years, I've just been making bleeps and bloops in a spare room in my house by myself, for myself. Sometimes, you know, I'll mess around for a little while. I'll get discouraged. I'll turn everything off and not touch it again for a couple of weeks. But with streaming, you have an audience of people who are actually there to hear that sort of thing. Uh, who, you know, there are full groups of people who just make ambient and noise. And it's amazing that you find the other people who are into that sort of thing. And when I'm, you know, messing around in the studio and I'm firing off missed shot after missed shot, people are there for that. They want to see that. They want to see that process. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really helped me develop musically instead of getting discouraged and, you know, going and turning on the PlayStation. I'm like, I've, I've got a couple people watching me here. I have to work through this. Yeah. I have to learn right now. And it's definitely changed me for the better. Yeah. I, I was going to add that as well from, from my experience. Um, I've only, I've streamed very little. It's, it's some on Instagram. I don't think ever on this particular, uh, structures channel, but um, mostly the way I get to that, the means to that end, like you're describing for me, is I like to record live and, and not edit it and just record my jams. And, and I force myself to figure it out. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, yeah. Kind of push my like, OK, like if I can't turn it off, you know, like play performing, you know, in my head. Well, yeah, what, what am I going to do from here? You know, and it really does help you grow a lot. Uh, and learn a lot when you basically just challenge yourself, you know. And eventually it ends up being fun instead of scary, because at first it's a little scary. Like yeah. I remember the first few times I streamed just kind of freaking out a few minutes in, like, I don't know what I'm doing. I have nothing going on. Oh, no. Uh, but then you figure it out and you find something. And, you know, you've mentioned a couple times not streaming much. And for those listeners out there who are kind of wary of streaming themselves, viewers are so important on these platforms as well. You know, I talk about a big synthesizer community. Uh, not everybody there plays. A lot of people are just fans and they like the culture and they like the people and they like to listen. So yeah. there's really a spot there for everybody. That's a good point. Yeah. I, I've never, uh, even if someone didn't play music, it's it never been uh, unpleasurable to have someone uh, show interest, you know? Yeah, Absolutely. So it's just another form of encouragement, like, hey, someone's digging it, even if it was just a little piece or a, or a, or a, you know, long time uh, admirer of your sound, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, what it comes down to is, if if you like something, <clears throat> chances are there are other people out there who like it too. Yeah, for sure. And and uh, if and if there aren't, then you've just found something new. And you should keep doing that. Yeah, and that could be a gold mine, right? We just have to find uh, yeah. the other mic, the millionaire mic, to uh, fund us, and then uh, we'll be all set. <laughs> right. Millionaire mic, if you're out there, hit please, me up. Please call uh, email <laughs> structuresmusic at gmail.com. <laughs> or hivemindsynthesis at. Oh, yeah, just email mike at hivemindsynthesis.com. <laughs> So we, I know we got on a tangent there talking about our process and, uh, and making sound, and I love that stuff. But I want to um, give you all the time in the world to uh, continue on with your story of your personal growth and uh, life experience and, and that of the company as well. Oh, yeah, sure. So uh, the company is small. I know everyone talks about how you should 
act like your your business or whatever you're doing is the biggest, most successful thing. Uh, but you know, I'm just getting started. I've only been doing this full time for about a year and a half, and I'm definitely learning a lot of things about being a, a business owner instead of working for someone else, which yeah. is great. I really enjoy it. Uh, it's it's hard out there in the cor- corporate world. I spent a long time working for other people doing customer service and sales and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I, I think I'm an asset to myself, which is nice. That's a good uh, when it comes to the Yeah. <laughs> but when it comes to, you know, the process uh, and the, my story, it's really kind of probably pretty typical. I just love to play music. I love to perform in every way that one can perform. Just like, put me on a stage, give me something to do, and I'll do it. Uh, you know, they used to make me MC the holiday party at the last company that I worked at because nobody else would do it. And just give Mike a microphone, and he'll get up there and babble away for a little while. It's fine. Yeah, uh, test uh, Mike to, to Mike to Mike. Right, exactly. Uh, so it just kind of came from that playing. You know, my drummer roots playing in all kinds of bands. You know, from ska bands, industrial bands, played in a lot of math rock bands. Uh, Mostly, really, when I was living up in Massachusetts for about a decade, then I moved back down here to the Philly area and have been kind of struggling to find the same sort of scene, uh, mostly because I don't do much. I'm a bit of a homebody. Yeah. And Twitch is great for that because you can play 12 shows a week if you want to, and you never have to leave your house. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It, if you put the cameras right, you don't even have to put pants on. Yeah. <laughs> Or if you put them in the wrong spot, you can still do what you want, I guess. But you might get a flat. Right. Huh? <clears throat> yeah, just maybe not on Twitch. Save that. Save that for the only sense. Only sense. I love it. <laughs> so, how many cameras do you have in your setup? You mentioned different camera angles. Let's talk about the. Oh the, yeah, the so aspect a little bit. Oh yeah, if we want to talk about technical stuff. So right now, I run really a four camera setup. I have an overhead camera that shows my wall of gear, which is built onto a couple of pegboards uh, with a bunch of hooks. So I have, I I live in a tiny house. My whole house is 750 square feet. Uh, And I do all of my business and all of my music out of this little eight by 10 room. Hey Mike, you're not gonna believe this. I live in a tiny house too. Oh yeah? Yes, I do, yeah. Uh, It's kind of great. Yeah, I, like, we'll, we'll we'll catch we'll catch up more later. I see that there's too many okay. coincidences to to not uh, dive deeper in this connection we've made here on online. But uh, go please go ahead with your oh yeah. Uh, your, well, your it, story. you know, talking about the tiny house thing, yeah. it really helps to introduce limitations in the same way that making music without a computer introduces limitations. Yeah, where yeah. I only have so much space in here, so I have to use it well. Use it well, yeah. Which efficient. is why I have, which is why I have a vertical setup that's about five feet tall off of the table, but only a foot and a half deep. Uh, so I have a camera that looks at that. I have another camera that has a cool face tracking feature that can actually follow me around the room. So I use that for when you actually want to see what I'm up to. Yeah. A camera overhead for my modular synth, and then another camera above my little digital drum kit so that I can catch all that stuff. Um, and it's, you know, all, for the most part, inexpensive cameras. Like, I don't think, with the exception of that face tracking camera that I was actually lucky enough to have my Twitch viewers buy for me. Oh, wow. Uh, everything else is a cheap camera under 50 bucks. That was such a nice gift. That's shout out to all those people that yeah, made that happen. It's, yeah, that Twitch community is great. That, they, they, my viewers picked that up for me, and I also run a video synthesizer during my setups. Again, trying to keep everything as outside of the box as possible. Uh, they picked that video synthesizer up for me a couple of years ago, and it's called the IZ. It's made by Critter and Guitari, and it's a really cool little box that takes audio and MIDI signals and outputs all kinds of cool programmable graphics. If you're If you're a programmer who knows Python, you can really create a lot of cool stuff with it. I wouldn't know anything at all about programming, but the concept sounds super cool. It reminds me of just what you're 
opened with early on and having the natural elements uh, influence the sound, you know? Yeah, and I also don't know anything about that programming, but I luckily know how to find friends who do. Yeah. They can help me out. But instead of the wind affecting an LFO or whatever, you got your your, your sound influencing the, the, the video feed, right? Is that exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, really sound, cool. the sound and then even incoming MIDI <clears throat> information, whether it's note data or, you know, also, oh, not even a sound. Messages. Oh, oh, wow. Okay, this sounds really cool. They could cool. do both. Yeah. So you could literally sequence your uh, video, uh, t- what it's doing. You could sequence that yeah. just like, wow, that's okay. Wow. Mind blown. And Yeah, it's really cool. And I'll use that sometimes. Uh, my main sequencer in my setup is a poly end play. And I generally try to keep one channel on that just to send, just for even if it's just random messages to yeah. the video center. That's so cool. Just to give us some movement. I, uh, it, when you're making electronic music, it tends to be very repetitive. Yeah. And I really personally enjoy repetitive music with slow building changes, something that you can really kind of zone out into or just have running in the background. But yeah. for whatever reason, when I'm making electronic music i'm always worried that everybody's going to get bored so i'm always trying to find some way to spice things up to throw something else to look at or to hear or to do into the process that's uh really interesting that you mentioned that um because i'm curious i think the same thing like uh i could record a, a 10 or 20 minute jam and i i could listen now sometimes it's shit, of course, but then sometimes, oh, yeah. sometimes I have one that's like, man, this I do like this, and I could listen to it several times and dissect and and learn things about what I did. But then I think, is anyone else would, would they be interested in this long of a thing? You know, is that just everyone about their own music, or is that a human nature thing because of our attention span? What do you think it is with that? Because I do well, enjoy I, longer form stuff. You know, I I feel like there's there's always an element of self-doubt and imposter syndrome going into it that way too, where it's like, well, I like this thing and this is, you know, I like this, this thing conceptually of these longer songs that, that take a while to develop. Uh, And, you know, they're out there in the world and they're popular with a lot of people, but when I make one, I don't know if people are going to like it. And the only way you can find out is by sharing it. Yeah, it's true. And chances are if, you like it someone else is going to like it too yeah it's like what you said you said that before that's that's going to be the main point but (laughs) when when you're working live and you're kind of up on that tightrope at that time you know you're still looking at the ground you're not thinking about the fact that you've done it before and that there's a net and that there's a crowd cheering you on you're just like oh crap i'm up on this tightrope yeah yeah which is kind of what makes it so fun that that performing live without a computer long form thing is that it's, you know, it's like a circus act. It's like spinning plates. You have a whole bunch of things going at once, and you're just kind of trying to hold it all together so there's not a gory mess for the crowd. Uh, yeah, and I think part of it is for me at least, um, like the adrenaline type emotion or feelings. You know, like the. Like you said, just trying oh, to hold, yeah. hold it together. Kind of the, oh, shit, flying by the seat of your pants uh, sometimes, you know, trying to think faster than the machine and 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 uh, guide it, you know, and not let it fall apart. And to me, it's it's the, the what do you call the, the just the n- natural little slight nervousness of the whole situation. Like, and if it does go shit, it's fine. It's just you're just having fun anyway, but right. the, the excitement right. no, I, of it, you know what I mean? Yeah, it could be super exciting, especially when it goes well, or when you see yourself starting to go into some sort of nosedive, uh, especially like working with synthesizers, working with a modular synth, the number of times I've had, because I generally stream for about two hours at a time, and I can't tell you how many times I've gotten an hour into a stream, and I've thought, oh yeah, this is really good, and then I go and make some modifications, and then it just becomes to be unlistenable yeah and you know you just kind of pushed it a little too far but then you learn how to back it off and that you know that becomes fun again well i don't know go ahead go ahead i was gonna say also for me a big part of it is that it's a wonderful cop-out 
to perform live improvised music all the time because if you've never played a song before, you can't play it wrong. Right. So by constantly just making it up as I go along, I don't have to worry about not playing what people expect, not playing what I expect because there are no expectations. I agree. And once you tune into that natural flow, um, it's almost like you kind of, I mean, you're still trying to hold it together, but you're also releasing the responsibility of it. You know, you're trying to yes. showcase what's already there, that kind of vibe uh, or approach, you know? So, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, when you follow the sound, um, some, you got to do it for yourself. It doesn't really matter if someone else would have followed it that direction or not. If you were led to follow it that way, then you go explore and fulfill that curiosity you know and uh, yeah and i think it could apply that same thing to anything in life really yeah. that when it comes down to it you've got to you've got to do it for yourself you've got to make sure you know it's what you want and need or are having fun with yeah and then you can start thinking about everybody else on top of that but in the end be to thy own self be true i guess yeah I, I love that, man. I'm, and I'm glad that the conversation went that direction because that's, you know, the, the theme of the show, you know, like the the, the story of life and sound is, it, it's hard for me to explain in, in a concise sentence, you know, but it's that kind of thing, it, relating our artistic journey to our life journey and uh, the openness to uh, learn and explore and grow and how our art and life just for a lot of us is so intermingled and reflective and just helps us on the, the whole journey. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'd, I'd be bored out of my mind if I wasn't doing this. That's for sure. Yeah. It's well, I have, a, I have another couple of hobbies, but this making sounds is, uh, definitely, uh, it's like a therapeutic, uh, uh, passion for me too. Like it's yeah. very, very helpful. Yeah. So when you said you you'd go crazy if you weren't doing this, do you mean, uh, per, you know, making music or or working on making devices, or both? Well, just a little, or just creating something. Yes. I uh, yes. there are a lot of people out there who don't have that creative urge, and I'm almost envious because I constantly want to be making something, yeah. doing something. Uh, and this is a, a great way of kind of funneling that energy. You know, when I was a kid, it was always ripping apart my Lego kits and building something new out of them. But yeah, yeah. as as a fully formed adult, I get to do some some more tangible and some wider reaching things. Yeah, that's that's a good point. It's like if if I somehow lost the ability, you know, to make uh, sounds, there would have to be some kind of creative outlet. You know. Yeah, yeah. There's just I think in most people there's some sort of draw to create something, like whether it's musical art to decorate time, whether it's physical art to decorate space, whether it's you know cooking, home decor, what, whatever it might be. There's that urge in all of us to take what's inside of our heads and put it on the outside so that we can share it with the rest of the world. Yeah, well said. Well said. And I think that there's a lot more people that maybe could be doing that in some way, but haven't really turned on to that idea, maybe, you know? That and, and it's hard because there are all of the responsibilities that come along with just being a, a person who is alive as part of our society. Especially there are bills to pay. Age. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to, you've got to keep a roof over your head and you're, you know, there's family stuff and there's there are all of these other things that take up your time and more importantly take up your, your mental energy where even if you have the time your brain's just too exhausted to yeah. do anything about it yeah so it's, it's tough to eke that out but i think it's almost always good when you do even if you just sketch something out on a piece of paper and throw it away you'll probably feel better afterwards yeah, that's interesting you mentioned that because just last year I started uh, making frequent use of taking notes and keeping a note, notepad near me, and it has helped a lot just keep things flowing through my mind, and either 
out of my mind or into reality by making a list of things to do, something like that, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just taking that, that intangible thought and just putting it somewhere where you can make it real and visible and, and come back to it and it's the same as it was when you left it. Yeah. Mike, it's been about an hour and I wasn't going to cut you off, but it's starting to rain here and I'm in the loft and I got a metal roof. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know what that sounds like. And... I'm willing to roll the dice on it, but I'm just throwing it out there. Like, it's the way it sounds, it sounds like it's coming in and not just blowing over. Yeah, I mean, it's it's up to you. Yeah. Um, let's do, let, yeah, let's go ahead. And I'm, I'm pretty happy with, um, uh, not that I have to judge the, the episode, but I'm, I'm just really stoked on our conversation. And oh, good. Me too. The points that we talked about, and uh, also just from one uh, artist and, and person to another, man, I'm so glad that we met um, and, and got to know each yeah, other. Yeah, me too. And I definitely will stay in touch, man. And um, and I hate that the rain cut it off, but maybe that's just serendipitous that that we, we covered the things we did. And uh, you know, it's just you know, nature pop it in and saying hey this is this is the next step isn't that yeah that's so cool because you were talking about the the weather affecting the synthesizer it, it yeah that's that's magical man that's that's too cool <laughs> um let me go ahead and let's let's have tell you tell people where they can find you online and uh i can't remember if i asked you that already or not i think i did oh yeah I'll uh, just give a, a do it quick. Again. Just do it again, and also, yeah. if you have any shout shout outs or anything at all you want to uh, wrap up with before I close, go for it. All right. Yeah. So here we go. Uh, you can find me on Twitch, Twitch TV slash the Killer Bee Relay Team. Really, I am the Killer Bee Relay Team everywhere. Uh, you find me on YouTube, Instagram. You won't find me on Facebook. Uh, but you'll find me pretty much everywhere else under that name. Uh, Hive Mind Synthesis for my noise-making endeavors, all the little gadgets and gizmos that I'm working on there. Uh, Thick Wickens is the band. Thickwickens.bandcamp.com. You can find our two EPs there. Uh, GSG.live is where you can find the Golden Shrimp Guild. Uh, Pretty much always on, you'll find somebody live streaming some synthesizer music there. Uh, we have a super active Discord community. I really, if you're even considering becoming a part of it, you should. If it if it sparks a little bit of interest in you at all. Cool. Uh, also, let's see shout outy stuff. I have a new remix that just came out on a friend's record. Uh, look for Nicholas Burgess. The record's called. Creepus Remixes and uh, my remix of this track Creepies is on there so I'd like to give him a little shout out as well since that just dropped actually as we started recording this podcast today oh nice nice uh, and yeah I think that covers it okay uh, so well you you heard that and if you didn't write it down put it in the notes uh because I know they'll be in the notes because I'm going to have Mike text me all that stuff because I cannot uh, <laughs> remember and the spelling and everything. I don't trust myself. So I'll get that from Mike and put it all in the notes too. And, um, dude, I look forward to talking to you again soon. And as I suspected, the rain is, is rolling in, so it's perfect timing. T totally a magical little meeting and conversation we had. I'm, I'm glad we captured it when we did, man. Yeah, me too. Thanks for finding me. Dude, no problem. Um, I'm going to close out the show, and then if you hang on, I'll, I'll give you a proper goodbye here in just a minute. Sounds good. All right. Thanks for tuning in to Structures, episode uh, whichever one it was. That's, was it seven? I don't know. But it's the one since you heard last, and it's the one before you hear the next one. So come back and for next week and also stay tuned uh if mike's willing to to come back and and talk some more because we i feel like we barely got into it does that sound good to you mike that sounds wonderful all right well we'll talk to you later peace mm -hmm.